I'm Ashton Addison from Event Chain for Investment Pitch Media and FinTech News Network. And today on Blockchain Interviews, we have Jimmy Song, Bitcoin developer, advocate, and entrepreneur. Jimmy, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show. I'm really excited for this discussion today, and I'm glad that you're here. Well, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. If you could briefly explain, uh, to kick it off, how you first got into cryptocurrencies and what efforts and initiatives you've been doing to help grow the Bitcoin economy, uh, that'd be a great way to start. Yeah, so I've been a developer for over 20 years now, and I heard about it back in 2011 when I was working for a startup back in Boston. And essentially, I, I saw a story on Slashdot that Bitcoin had broken $1, and I couldn't really even parse that sentence. I was like, "What bro is this a change machine? What, what, what breaks a dollar? <laughs> um, since then, I've just sort of fallen down the rabbit hole. 2013, I started uh, doing some open source contributions to various Bitcoin open source projects. And since then, I've, uh, I've gotten involved in education, especially, uh, you know, doing programming Bitcoin. That's a book from O'Reilly, also Little Bitcoin book. Um, that's more for less for programmers and more for the mass market. Um, and I've been writing lots of articles and uh, and speaking and doing things like that. Mm -hmm. That's great. And yeah, the industry has grown so much just in the past five years. It seems to be on this exponential growth curve. And part of that is because of the Ethereum ecosystem and then this ICO craze and people raising capital and uh, all this injection of institutional money. Uh, however, it was really Bitcoin that started it all. And I'd love to hear you know, your hypothesis on the future of cryptocurrencies. A lot of people say you know, Bitcoin will be the only coin left standing. Um, some say there'll be a big diversity of coins. Do you believe that uh, we'll have a lot of coins around in the future or how do you see that playing out? Well, the way I see the ecosystem is everyone is competing to be money um, and they, they may have rhetoric around anything else. But the reason why the price goes up and down is because people want to uh, use it to store value. Essentially, uh, with money, if you uh, if you think about you know how it works economically and and everything, it's uh, it's inefficient if everybody's using a different currency. You have to convert it and so on. This mm -hmm. was why bimetallism wasn't very popular because you had to constantly do a lot of math in your head in order to figure that out. So I, I believe that there will be only one real currency, and that's going to be Bitcoin. The network effects are there. Um, uh, the, it's become the shelling point, if you will, of, uh, of the currency space. So a as a result, um, all of these other coins have to find some other use case. And I've, I've been looking for seven years. I haven't seen a single one that has any traction outside the people that are holding the token. So mm -hmm. I don't believe that any of them will um, amount to anything, though, you know, I'm open to being wrong. Obviously. Definitely. And so with these coins like, you know, Ethereum and things that have more functionality than money, do they serve another purpose and I believe they will survive and maybe they're not trying to exactly duplicate what Bitcoin is doing? Is there is there room yeah, for that in the industry? I mean, they're they're certainly trying, and they've been trying for many years to try to find another use case. And uh, I've noticed the narrative continues changing. It's uh, you know we we have non fungible tokens and code is law, smart contracts. Now it's like DeFi, and uh, then it's gonna get into something else. It, it's always like a new narrative coming in because mm -hmm. they realize very quickly. As uh, soon as Crypto Kitties is unpopular, that's that's no longer the main use case. Um, yeah. it, it's a uh, it's a way to market the token, and really, most of these coins, other than Bitcoin, have to rely heavily on marketing in order to get any yeah. traction whatsoever, because uh, there there aren't really users on this thing. I mean, you mm -hmm. look at something like Augur, decentralized betting marketplace. They have like forty users uh, users mm -hmm. a day. Any website that gets only forty users a day would be completely dead by now. The only reason that they exist is because of their pre-sale and the fact that they can keep marketing to the people that have already bought it. Definitely. And part of the properties of sound money, you know, and Bitcoin has to fit all three of these in order to you know, have global adoption. One of them is being a store of value. And part of that is to do with the stability and, and the volatility. And it's often been uh, argued that you know Bitcoin isn't a store of value because it is volatile. Now, do you think that this is because it's early in the industry, um, or there needs to be some room for stability? And obviously, everything's relative on what define is defined as stable. And usually, they say, well, it's more stable than the emerging economies that have hyperdeflation. But what about with developed economies like the U.S. dollar and the Canadian dollar, which are supposedly stable? You know, is it 
considered a, a stable store of value right now? Well, with respect to the U.S. dollar, absolutely not. And we cover some of this in the book. I mean, we, we talk about volatility in Chapter 3, and there's a question in the back. Um, the, the main reason for Bitcoin's volatility is because it's not centrally managed. Um, almost every other currency in the world besides the U.S. dollar has to make sure that they stay within a peg range uh, for their economies to function properly. You, you price your currency too high, and you can't get any imports. You price it too low, then you can't get any exports, and, and so on. So... Uh, most of these uh, uh, these other currencies, uh, say like the Canadian dollar or the Australian dollar or uh, you know the Nigerian naira, whatever, they they all have a central bank that manages that, and mm -hmm. um, and that's what keeps those uh, currencies quote unquote stable is because somebody's managing it. Bitcoin's decentralized; it has no manager, it has no central bank, so that means that as a result, the uh, the natural volatility of the market is. Uh, you know, happens basically, and it, there's no dampening effect by these centralized entities. Um, and uh, but as a result, uh, we don't uh, Bitcoin doesn't suffer from sort of the black swan events that a lot of these mm -hmm. central banks suffer from. Uh, a lot of these pegs break, and then you know, like somebody like George Soros makes like billions of dollars, like betting against the Bank of England or something like mm -hmm. that. So, in a sense, it's a lot more fair. And uh, but you know, as as Bitcoin becomes more uh more prominent and i expect that volatility to decrease and, but to answer your question which is you know in developed countries what's the use well uh the fact of the matter is that monetary expansion in every western economy has been tremendous over the last 60 years if you look at something like the u.s dollar and uh the inflation number that we are all told is the cpi or the consumer price index and that's uh, around two or three percent every year magically somehow um but you look at the actual monetary expansion since 1959 the federal uh st louis federal reserve um publishes the m2 money supply since 1959 to right now um and it's gone up in the last 60 years by 51x so that means that there was about $280 billion of U.S. dollars in existence in M2 money in 1959. 2019, it was something like $14.9 trillion. So that, you annualize that, that ends up being about 6 or 7%. Mm -hmm. So if, if you think about it that way, keeping it in dollars, you're just really bleeding money very slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, and Bitcoin is sort of the alternative. Now, there's stocks and real estate, which uh, which are if if you're very good, you can get seven percent on either of those. But those require a lot more research and so on. Mm -hmm. I think Bitcoin is a much fairer store of value that's available to everyone everywhere instead mm -hmm. of having to become a Silicon Valley insider. So you have the right to, you know, like invest in some uh, specific hedge fund that might get you those returns. Um, you can you can just put your money into Bitcoin that frees up a lot of um uh, you know, effort into storing value and instead puts it into building things and um, putting that capital to work. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that, you know, you also reference the, the stock market and real estate and trying mm -hmm. to um, can maintain a store of value. But at the same time, you're, you're sort of investing in those industries in order to grow your money, you know, and by holding Bitcoin, you know, is it more classified as you're using it to store your money or are you actually using it to invest because it's it's going to appreciate or you're going to avoid the the uh, the inflation so is it a bit of both well I, I don't really see a distinction between either one the reason why you invest is so that you don't lose everything i, I mean mm -hmm. sometimes some people are more or less I, I think if you have the risk of losing everything then it's more like gambling and less mm -hmm. like investing. So I, I don't really see necessarily a big distinction between the two, but I would say that Bitcoin is a superior store of value for that reason. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't you don't have to have insider knowledge uh, about, you know, uh, which stocks are going to go up or which ones are in merger talks and whisper numbers about earnings or whatever. Um, uh, instead, you, you just invest in something that's extremely fungible. So that means that you get one unit of Bitcoin in Indonesia. It's the mm -hmm. same exact one that you're getting here. So uh, in, in that way, I, I, I see this as a much more just and fair investment. There's a reason why every time like the, the Fed lowers rates that the stock market goes up. It's because everyone knows that that's where you go to store your value, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's where, and every, everyone that's in the stock market is front running the monetary expansion that's about to happen mm -hmm. as a result of lower rates. So um, I suspect that a lot of that will go away as uh, Bitcoin adoption come, uh, comes comes uh becomes more prominent uh but i mean a lot of us in bitcoin we already know this and uh, and we we've built up habits that have gone down this way mm -hmm. 
And a lot of American investors are starting to warm up to Bitcoin in the last year, especially with the introduction of more institutional products, you know, seeing ETFs, futures, staking and lending and all of these other kinds of uh, derivative products of Bitcoin. Do you see that as a good step forward for Bitcoin itself as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash? Um, or is it moving in the right direction for Bitcoin to become a global currency? Uh, I, I think it becomes uh, it's uh, definitely moving towards uh, more of a settlement layer. And um, and I'm, I, I'm totally fine with that. I, I, I think that's a very useful thing. Uh, like I said, there there are really very good stores of value that are easily accessible by everyone in the world. Um, Bitcoin is that. And that, that's the direction that we're moving towards. And as far as these institutions and so on, they're making Bitcoin a little more accessible to, say, somebody that's like 65 that isn't familiar with computers as much or um, is comfortable like uh, opening an account on, um, you know, Kraken or something like that. It, it's a lot easier uh, for them to just go buy a ticker, um, which they can already kind of do with GBTC. Um, but regardless, uh, you know, all, all of this is to say that there's more money flowing into Bitcoin because it's proven itself as a really good store of value. And, uh, and really the big, uh, big thing that we've had to overcome is the fact that we just haven't had enough time or for people to really trust it. If it's been around <laughs> for only like a few years, it's harder to trust than something that's been around uh, now going on 11 years. So um that's that's a very good thing and I, I i think that'll help with the adoption more than anything else mm -hmm. yeah there's definitely that curve of you know, we're still sort of in the early adopters phase as we just sort of passed the 10-year mark uh, of bitcoin even existing and many currencies you know for even for late adopters to start joining it could be decades still uh you know many people in that are uh, in their older years are not even texting or, or using credit cards on the internet. Never mind, they're still afraid that scammers are going to take their credit card on the internet, you know, where that um, has been around for so long now. So super interesting to see. And uh, in your book, The Little Book of Bitcoin, um, you talk about, you know, Bitcoin has a lot of real world use cases and you always hear this, you know, uh, remittances or emerging economies, it's supposed to help. Um, but going back to developed countries again, um, do you see, besides going to uh, the corner store, or going to a bar that accepts Bitcoin and using it to, to buy products, um, is that the main use case right now? And is that how people should be using it? Or are there more things to elaborate on? Well, I, I think that's actually a terrible way to use your Bitcoin is to essentially sell it for some beer or uh, or groceries or whatever. I uh, like it, it's an asset that's uh, that's uh, more a digital gold, a, a store of value. And mm -hmm. for me, that that's that's an enormous uh, thing uh, for civilization in general, because of uh, sort of the Keynesian ideology that most governments operate under, which is to get the velocity of money flowing, right? The sluices and all that. Um, and that requires there being no good store of value. That requires, because any time that there is a good store of value, that's where money parks and mm -hmm. there's no velocity, there's no spending or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that, that's sort of the mentality or uh, of all of these, um, you know, uh, central bank chairmen and so on. So, by uh, by going away from that, uh, you know, Bitcoin produces a good store of value, whereas in in the fiat economy, there really isn't any uh, like I, like we were saying, like stocks and real estate require trem tremendous research, but also tremendous transaction costs like mm -hmm. to buy a significant amount of anything. Um, you, you very quickly need a lot more liquidity and you're trading against like, uh, you know, these bots that are high frequency trading and so on. So, I mean, you're, you're as an individual investor, you're, you're much more likely to get wrecked. Um, but with something like Bitcoin, it's, uh, you know, now you have something for the common man, some, something that you don't need a, you know, brokerage account or something like that. You can just go and buy it, um, you know, from your neighbor if you wanted to. It's, it's mm -hmm. uh, like you don't need anyone's permission or uh, to be an accredited investor or anything like that. There are no permissions that you need. And that's that's part of the beauty of it. Totally. And another part of the beauty of Bitcoin is the underlying technology, which is the blockchain, which everyone says is, you know, the killer app where you can store things and that's the real transfer of value. Um, however, in the use case of Bitcoin being a store of value where people aren't often making 
transactions. There's no there's not a lot of transactions being recorded on the blockchain. You know, I've heard this theory that well, if nobody's moving Bitcoin around, then the network sort of loses its value because that is the underlying value of the blockchain is that there are transactions happening in a network effect. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, so, I mean, that that's the theory based on sort of a, me, a method of payment use case for Bitcoin. I, um, but, I mean, scarcity itself is a network effect, and not a lot of people re realize this. Um, if, I, if I value something because it's scarce, now you're going to value it because at the very least you can sell it to me and, so, uh, and, and get, get your value back. Mm -hmm. um, the more people do that, the quicker it grows and more people trust it and so on. So uh, I, 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 that, that's a bigger network effect, in my opinion, not like merchant adoption. There's, there's hundreds, literally hundreds of different uh, payment processors that are trying to break into the market. I mean, mm -hmm. not only do you have like, uh, you know, cash and bank checks, um, you also have credit cards. Uh, you also have lots of newer players that are trying to come in, uh, PayPal, Venmo, Cash App. Um, and in like entire regions like Hong Kong, you have like the Octopus card, which you use for absolutely everything. Those are way more convenient as mm -hmm. uh, as methods of payment than Bitcoin ever will be, I think. Yeah. Um, the, there are layers on top that you can build possibly that might get there, but that's a long way away. The main use case right now is as uh, digital um, scarce store of value that you can possess yourself that you don't need anyone's permission to own um, unlike almost anything else that's great jimmy well we're running out of time but uh thank you for all this in-depth information on bitcoin so far if their viewers are looking to learn more information or, or follow along with you what's the best way to learn more well, um, I, I teach a seminar, Programming Blockchain, which, uh, which is on my website, ProgrammingBitcoin.com. I also have uh, my, my books, um, the P Programming Bitcoin book and the Little Bitcoin book um, are available as links there. You can go to Amazon and buy it. Um, it's also available on Kindle, audiobook. Uh, we have it translated into Spanish and Portuguese so far. We have French, um, Arabic, Turkish, Vietnamese, Korean, Japanese, uh, I think Mandarin is sort of out. Um, lo lots of different languages so that uh, pretty much anyone in the world can understand what this thing is and how it will help change the world. Great. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Let's follow up in the near future. Thanks.